Hey everyone, this episode of the Breakpoint Show was recorded on August 8th, 2023. We hope you enjoy it. Hey everyone, we're back. So we weren't a one-hit wonder. We are we are back. So so you're gonna see more of us every two weeks. Uh this is the breakpoint show. We've kind of changed everything out in in uh the social media land. Because there's, there's quite a few Breakpoint podcasts, so we wanted to kind of have a slightly different name. So we are the Breakpoint Show now. Because we're just not audio. We are actually video. So you can actually find us on YouTube. Uh, not that any three of us have faces for uh, for video. We're, we're mostly faces for, for audio. But uh, I just want to welcome my co-hosts, Martin and uh, Khalid. Oh, thank you. And thank you, Chris. Say, uh, thank yeah. you, indeed. Yeah. yeah. So, you know what? The first episode was a lot of fun. I think this one's going to be fun. We're going to talk about, like, open source and open source projects and where we can find open source is it easy to find open source projects in 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 the dot net uh ecosystem and then kind of talk about where we are at in the kind of life period or or the life cycle of uh of dot net so uh so i'm gonna throw it out to either one of you guys like how do you find open source projects for .NET. Can I can I start with a hot take on that one? Just sure. just because it's early in the episode and we should sure. start off with hot takes uh, every once in a zingers. while. Yeah. Um, not on NuGet. How's that for a hot take? Um, I, I think Khalid will agree with me on this one, but uh, NuGet is not a place to find open source projects. Yeah, uh, it is once you st one, once you know a library, once you know that there is something specific out there that you want to include in your project, absolutely NuGet. But uh, in terms of discovering new projects, uh, I don't think NuGet is the right place. You know, uh, I it's not a hot take if you agree with it, Martin. So uh, we'll start off this podcast by agreeing with you. <laughs> but it it is tough on NuGet because um, there's kind of vestiges of .NET in NuGet. And what I mean by that is like .NET has always predominantly been a project heavy solution based ecosystem. So something that is like a logical solution that is maybe considered one project ends up being a hundred packages, right? And if you go to the NuGet feed and you scroll down, you'll see, uh, I'll pick on one of the uh, tech overlords here. Uh, but you'll see a thousand Amazon packages for AWS, right? Uh, and that typically will drown out, you know, uh, you know, your your artist artisan open source author who publishes one package out there on NuGet. So scanning from like the latest packages released is really difficult, just because those thousands of packages that get released on every single commit by these big corporations essentially drown out any actual packages coming from small independent open source authors so yeah, uh, yeah i agree thing, with but but even then if uh, that would not be the case and you would not see the packages of our big tech overlords uh, it <laughs> would still be hard to discover anything there because it's just a stream of whatever gets published at some points, but it's it's almost like looking at a, at a commit log of a really big open source project. I mean, very often you see some gems in there, but most of the time it's just a stream of messages that you don't really care about, or maybe don't don't see the value in and, and you want to care about them. So I do think there would, it, it would be nice to have a new mechanism or a better mechanism of discovering open source. Yeah, yeah. I, I think consume, I consuming we have covered with NuGet, but discovering is yeah. a is a different story. Yeah, and uh, looking at NuGet packages by the number of downloads doesn't do anything because there's so many small little packages that everyone download. Like every single uh, new .NET package 
need certain kinds of packages that uh, they just get over and over again. So even even uh, number of downloads doesn't show a good a good uh, a view of of uh, new and exciting ideas in in the .NET ecosystem. So and there's no one really curating any anything. I mean, there's no effort around that. I, I find most of the time I just see people talking about stuff on on social media platforms like Macedon or X, the previous X previously known as Twitter. Maybe and, by uh, the time we publish this podcast, the name will have changed again. So yeah, we'll maybe see. it may be why at that point. So so I just I just imagine the next name will be a bunch of screeching noises. Uh just <laughs> you know, like unpronounceable screeches. So yeah, everyone will go around symbol, making noises like at Prince. Each other. <laughs> like, be some symbol like like Prince had for a while. Mm -hmm. I but, feel sad. Uh, we shouldn't. We probably shouldn't compare Prince to X. Prince. Prince no, is a legend. So. No, that he he was a legend. <laughs> so, um, but even things, uh, properties like the .NET Foundation, who I thought would be a good, a good citizen around getting new open source projects out to the uh, to the community. They, they've done a decent job, um, but I still don't think they, there's no one there kind of keeping their eye on the community and looking out for interesting new, new topics. Now, maybe this will get someone interested in doing that and, and maybe some exciting new website will pop up with, with, curation or could i mean i'm gonna bring in the biggest buzzword right now could ai like do something mm -hmm. around that could could ai discover <laughs> i don't know i don't know i uh, i would i'll just come out and say no right like if, if you're thinking about like large language models then no if we're talking about classification with ai maybe right like so if if we created buckets of interest, say like mobile, web, like all the tags that you might put on a package, we can classify those things and maybe uh, rate them on like a recommendation engine like Netflix would, but for open source projects, like that's a possibility. But ultimately I feel like packages are so complex that you do need a human to kind of evaluate whether they're actually valuable for a large swath of the .NET community. So yeah, well, I, and yeah. I almost feel NuGet. We should rise above NuGet because mm -hmm. most open source projects are made up of one more than one NuGet package mm -hmm. because of yeah. the way that they're they're broken out and decoupled depending on platforms and other technologies that they interface to. Uh, so you usually don't get one giant NuGet package that that does everything for that project, which is smart. I'm I totally agree with that. So there has to be something that that kind of rises up to the top that that talks about a a project instead of the packages that make up that project. Yeah. I mean, to, to be fair to NuGet, they have added features on the project level that make understanding why a project exists. And you can bring in things like your README directly on your package page. So I think those are really good improvements to NuGet, the site. Um, the, it's a balance between what does the site provide and also the ecosystem itself and the authors taking the time to use those features as well. So yeah. the thing you notice a lot on NuGet is like that blue icon that's the default for packages. That's like the predominant icon for a lot of projects. When you go in, there's typically not a project URL for the package. So it's just like a random package with no visibility into the source code or back to the GitHub repo. 
Yeah. And um, yep. those are the things that I think hurt our ecosystem, especially in terms of discoverability. Yeah. But um, I guess, you know, you, you mentioned the way things are deployed to NuGet. Martin and I have been talking recently about like the shift to AOT and potentially is that going to dramatically change both how we think about deploying packages and the open source ecosystem. So like Martin, like what are your thoughts on AOT? Uh, I, I think uh, for things like performance, for reducing binary size and, and things like that, I think AOT is a great thing. Also the fact that you can actually target multiple platforms separately is a, is a big win. And I know .NET started with the premise of you write the code once and you run it everywhere. No, I think that was the JVM, but I mean, <laughs> on, on .NET, the idea was the same, right? You would write your code uh, one time and then the .NET runtime would actually take care of the rest mm -hmm. on every single platform. AOT is kind of the opposite where you do um, compilation targeting a specific platform. But the nice benefit of that is that you have smaller sizes, you have more performant code because you're actually targeting something and you don't have to compile or just in time compile on the machine itself. You do it ahead of time, hence mm -hmm. AOT. Um, so I, I do think that's a really good thing. Um, on the other hand, I also think that it might actually be something that is um, going to fragment our open source ecosystem a little bit. Um, and I'm not saying that because on NuGet, for example, people would distribute a Linux package and an ARM64 package and a, and a Mac OS package and, and things like that. I think the reason for that is to be able to do AOT, your project um, has to be compatible with AOT. So if you mm -hmm. use lots of reflection, for example, it's really hard to be able to do AOT because then uh, the compiler has no idea what you're doing with reflection. So it's going to fall back to just in time at that point. And I think if um, you or your company or your project team are really after that performance and all of the benefits you get from AOT, my fear right now is a little bit that because of fragmentation and maybe some open source projects that really heavily rely on reflection, that they would not jump on the AOT bandwagon and hence get, get left behind a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So where can people find more about AOT for in the .NET side? I'm I'm just curious my myself. Yeah, I, like I who's, think who's a big expert in it that they should follow out in the community. I don't know of any particular experts, but for me, I've just kind of been following the official Microsoft announcements. Uh, following folks at Microsoft who work on the .NET framework are probably good. Um, because .NET you, framework or .NET eight? Well, .NET eight. Yeah, .NET eight. Yeah, yeah. .NET 8. yeah. yeah. I don't want I, to I guess... confuse people by saying <laughs> .NET framework. We we, we don't going, talk oh, about oh, .NET framework yeah. anymore. So every yeah, time we, we mention .NET or .NET framework, it's it's the new .NET. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, like just following people who work on. I meant the .NET SDK aspect of it. So. Yeah. Um, like those are folks that are trying to build the foundations for what essentially amounts to the AOT stuff that people will be using. So uh, following folks working on the WebAssembly stuff is good because that's really where AOT is going to benefit a lot of people because yep. like we're trying to keep, you know, uh, artifact sizes down, uh, cloud native stuff. Uh, that's also where AOT is going to be good for things like uh, Azure Functions or uh, AWS Lambdas, uh, that should help, I guess, in those scenarios. Uh, so yeah. following those folks and following those topics are pretty good, but I still think it's way too early. <clears throat> I will also say I, I agree with Martin in the sense of like .NET developers are definitely addicted to reflection. Uh, I love me some reflection. I'm, I'm uh, guilty of it. Uh, it's just the meta programming model is just a lot of fun uh, to experiment with, but it does come at a cost. And a lot of our uh, .NET open source uh, packages are very reflection heavy because of the things that they do. So uh, we earlier we talked uh, before the, this podcast, we talked about... Um, you know, fluent validation, fluent assertions. Uh, we talked about uh, fluent migration, like all these fluent libraries. 
Uh, Auto Mapper heavily uses reflection. Uh, heck, even uh, MVC is heavily using reflection, right? So it's like even in the framework itself. Um, I know the .NET team is making strides to remove a lot of that, but I think it's going to be a long time before reflection yeah. is kind of banished <laughs> from from .NET, uh, if ever. So, yeah. yeah. Well, cool. Um, I mean, so you brought up some open source projects. What are, not trying to shift it too much, but we're trying to stay under 30 minutes with each episode. <laughs> what uh, what are the new and exciting open source projects that you guys have discovered <clears throat> lately? So um, you, you started off with the question about where do you actually find open source? And I think uh, good old word of mouth is definitely a place where you can actually find good open source projects. So um, I think last week or the week before, I posted something on Mastodon asking people the same question, essentially, what have you come across that is really interesting and really cool? Um, and there were a lot of really good replies to that. So um, we will post the link in the in the show notes as well. Uh, but essentially, a couple of the replies there were about uh, tools to, for example, read RSS data. Um, and, and I found feed reader there is uh, really, really simple to just pull in whatever you have uh, in terms of RSS feeds. Could be an Atom feed, could be RSS, and you can just consume it. Small little library. Uh, on the opposite side of the spectrum, there's some open source that is really massive. Uh, so I found the Jint, uh, the JavaScript interpreter for .NET, I think it's uh, is the full name. So that's mm -hmm. essentially a full JavaScript uh, engine that you can run in .NET. So if you have an application you want to do, you want to do extensibility, for example, using JavaScript, you could look into that one. It's massive. It's it's really cool. I don't think it's something that you will use day to day on every single project, but still, it's a, it's a really cool open source project that a lot of thought and a lot of effort has gone in apparently. And there's there's loads more on that threads that are really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was reading your thread, and one that kind of stuck out as interesting. I don't know if I would ever use it, but I, it's I can see why people in .NET would use it. It was like an architectural unit testing library where you essentially write unit tests against your solution to make sure that team members are following conventions. So mm -hmm. like, are models in the right layers? Are uh, things named correctly? And you run this architectural unit test to enforce kind of style uh, through unit testing, which I, I found kind of fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, I just wonder too, like, is tooling going to do that or is this like just across the board to enforce that kind of thing? So I forget what the name was. I don't know if Martin remembers. I was going to ask you, what what's the name of that one? Well, you know, we'll find it and we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it was something Arch Units. Yeah. Or something think, similar to that. Yeah. 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 But it, it was fascinating because I'm like, huh. I, I could see that. I could see the .NET community wanting to do this kind of thing. So yeah, it's yeah. definitely. I mean, I mean, it goes along with some of the tests that I do, especially with web APIs, the uh, integration tests, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which would be be good to to uh, have some kind of stand, team standards or or company standards around naming because naming is so hard. I mean. Yeah. Uh, my buddy Peter Ritchie, I'll give a plug for him. He does a lot of talks around naming is hard, and you have to really think about naming. But I mean, I always love the remember the old Brad Abrams uh, art, .NET architecture books. You remember? I, you remember those? I you, you you are showing your age now, but yes, <laughs> I, <laughs> I am. Mean, I'm showing I my am. age by confirming this, but but. but <laughs> If anyone wants to, there's some good older books that may be outdated on the technology, but the concepts are really good. Uh, so I think that's an A press, A press book. And if if it's still out there, people have it on their shelf, pull it down. There's some really good ideas around naming, like variable namings, assembly namings, just 
just naming in general to to make sure that that things are working well but i love the idea of like a architecture unit test that i could run through my ci cd pipeline and and get feedback and and mm -hmm. kind of stop things and push things back to the to the blame the blamer yeah. or the person getting blamed you just so. love yelling at people chris you're like you you buddy knock yeah. it off <laughs> i love having that red light go off because a person <laughs> broke the uh the uh uh devops pipeline the build yeah. but yeah. uh S speaking of uh, of that open source question and and the ones that really stood out there's actually one that i just re recalled uh, that looked really good i think it was called units net um, and oh, that yeah. project was really about doing something that all of us do all of the time in uh, in new projects. So the idea there is that they provide libraries for pretty much every unit. Could be length, could be temperature, could be speed, could be whatever. Um, and then have all kinds of conversions on that. So, for example, going from meters to centimeters, but also from meters to yards if you want, uh, and everything there, and in between. It's it's really cool, small library but really useful in a lot of cases, I think. Yeah. Well, that's good. I think the European Space Agency needed that for years ago when they were uh, they were building the Mars probe that that crashed because they didn't they didn't have a standard in uh, for distance or something like that. So <laughs> that's yeah, cool. As, as Americans, we refuse the metric system. We will measure things in fridges, dog feet. <laughs> Whatever, it just keep this metric system away from us. Well, I mean, look at look at the Brits. I mean, they still do stuff by stones, yeah. hands, like <laughs> horses. Here in the United States, horses are measured by some hand unit. Because I lived in in Kentucky, which is big thoroughbred horse <laughs> uh, land, and horses were were like it's so many hands and it's like, what? So I, I will say though, types. I will say though, the British with their accents get like a 20 point IQ bump just based on their accent as Americans, Chris, you and I have to struggle with whatever this accent is. I don't know what I it know. is. I know. Oh. I know whatever. <laughs> yep. Whatever this nasally, I, I have the Midwest U S Midwest nasally, uh, Michigan, Michigan accent. So, mm. but you know, we're, we're kind of coming down to the end and, you know, I keep hearing about new things with .NET, old things, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm curious, you know, we went through this, I'll say a attempted Renaissance with .NET when it went open source and it was reimagined with .NET Core, and there were uh, lots of people excited about that. I'm still excited about it. I think I think .NET is in a much better place than it was uh, before .NET Core 1.0 came out. But uh, do you? But I do have to think: Are we in a, a time loop? Are we kind of? Are we seeing .NET? not travel like this, but more like a circle that we're coming back to, to ideas and, or maybe a state where, where we're just not seeing a lot of developer community driven innovation. And, and we're still seeing it from, from Microsoft. Go ahead, Mark. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this one to you, Khalid, because I, I have a <laughs> philosophical thought about this entire question, Man. but I'm, I'm going to hold off on that one. Jeez, I just thought Martin would be our hot take person, but, you know, Belgians always have the spiciest uh, thoughts. But now I, I do think a little bit, you know, um, I think there was like a open source love fest when we first started this .NET core, now to .NET 8 journey. <clears throat> excuse me. And um, I, I think that's starting to cool off just based on where we are right now, which is um, I think, I think open source and sustainability kind of didn't work in the Donna ecosystem, probably based on our enterprise roots as an ecosystem. 
And I think we're just kind of realizing like, you know, let's, let's not pretend, <laughs> let's not pretend we're, we're something we're not as a community, which is like, um, we're focused on business problems and we're focused on the enterprise. And I think that's kind of where we're, we're heading back to that point. I think too, with the advent of things like AI um, assistance and things like that, I think you'll see a lot less people contributing to open source because like their solutions will be both a mix of their ideas and what AI is generating in their code base. So I think a lot more people will get to their solutions, maybe not the best solutions, but they'll get to their solutions faster and they probably won't reflexively think about releasing their stuff as open source. So I do think we're heading back to an era where there is probably less solutions coming from the community, more coming from the vendor, in this case, Microsoft. And uh, I think a lot less people will be sharing ideas unless those ideas come with uh, enterprise pricing and service support agreements. So uh, I, I would predict that seeing where we're sitting right now. And I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing. It's just, um, I do it's like sharing ideas with the community and stuff like that. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's being honest. I mean, we are not the hipster community, and and in a way, I don't want to be. I want to be a, uh, I want to have some maturity and let things bake and and have time to kind of go through validation within the community. I mean. Granted, the JavaScript, that open source web development community is starting to kind of stabilize. We have seen Angular and React kind of be uh, around for a long time, but we also see a lot of new stuff come along, which which is good because it, it pushes everyone else to, to think about stuff. So I would really just ask, our listeners and the audience and the .NET community keep pushing. Uh, don't rely on AI too much. Uh, but if you come up with new ideas, like push them out and share them. Because mm -hmm. it's the only way we're going to get better. I agree. Yep. I agree with that. Yeah. Martin. Yeah, and, and to, to answer your question about are we in a time loop, we are in IT. So by definition, we are in a time loop. Um, <laughs> We've seen XML-based web services and SOAP. Uh, we've seen uh, WSDLs uh, that define those services. Now we're at REST APIs and we have open API to describe what things look like. We've had, um, what was it called again? OData, yes, and, uh, and GraphQL doing kind of the similar thing. Um, so we are in a time loop where we keep reinventing the wheel. And my only hope is that whenever we make another loop and we start reinventing one of those wheels, we actually learn from the previous iteration to make the next iteration better. Um, yeah. I don't think we'll ever stop reinventing the wheel, but I do hope we keep creating better wheels in, uh, in yeah. many regards well, there. I mean, in terms of web services, we're back to our, like people are doing RPC, just, just like. There's just a G in front of it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. But at least that has some standards. I, I just remember in the 90s and calls over HTTP, like remember the original Facebook and Twitter APIs? Like you had to like read documentation to understand the verbs and everything about that, like the headers and the responses and what was in the body. And I mean, it was... We're, we're getting better, uh, so. Yeah. Well, I think to kind of like sum it up though, there's definitely hype cycles. And I think hype cycles make really big promises. And then we all kind of run towards it, especially in the .NET community. We're very susceptible to like the hype and marketing cycle that comes with .NET releases. Um, hey, we promise this new future is going to be uh, sunshine and unicorns and everything. But the reality is, yes, it's gotten a little better. But, you know, the, the expectations versus the reality is like 
it's going to take a couple iterations before we get to the best place, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. But it, like you said, like you folks said, uh, I, I think ultimately we are heading in the right direction and things are getting better. Um, some days I wish it was a little faster um, in terms of progress inside the community itself. But yeah, um, yeah like you said, Chris, uh, eloquently, uh, more people should share their ideas, even if they think they're silly or they think they're weird or um, maybe they're not don't think they're that interesting you'd be surprised uh when you share ideas what that can kind of lead to so yeah uh, if it that, starts someone else that. yeah yeah any i'm gonna i'm gonna open this up for just and anything that uh that has caught your eye in the last two weeks that you want to bring up any anyone that you want to call out or any any new ideas so call, call out, huh? I'm going to call out Martin. No, I'm just joking. I don't know. <laughs> or just give a plug to like who, who is doing a good job that we're, that we're seeing in the community right now. Cause um, we, yeah, should, I, we should pay respects to people. So I, I'm go, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in front of Martin here just <clears throat> cause he might say the same thing. I will. So stealing his Belgian thunder. Um, that's his new nickname, by the way. We we will call him Built and <laughs> Nice, <now>. nice. <laughs> but uh, no, the the Avalonia team has been really impressive, in my opinion. Like what they've been able to accomplish from uh, providing a solution for folks, um, working with the community, uh, building bridges for folks who are potentially stuck on things like WPF. Uh, and wanting to take their solution from being Windows only to cross-platform, uh, supporting like platforms like Linux, right? Like those are things that the Avalonia team are really focusing on because they're focusing on uh, giving their customers ways to get their solutions out to as many customers as possible. So Avalonia is definitely one of those projects that gives me a lot of hope uh, for .NET being a platform that um, finally meets the promise of cross-platform everywhere for almost everything. So, cool. um, yeah, Avalonia team's doing a great job. You did steal my thunder there, but I added it again. <laughs> if you're watching this on a video platform, I added it to my name, uh, so the thunder is back there. Um, I'm not going to call out anyone in particular. Um, I'm just going to call out what I see on X and Mastodon and so on. Um, I know Khalid and I have been complaining about the fact that .NET seems to have the same faces over and over again. And actually, our podcast is kind of the, the proof of that, where the same faces again over and over again. Uh, but I do want to call out that uh, on Mastodon, on, on X, or formerly named as Twitter, there's actually people joining our community, doing cool stuff. They start blogging, they start exploring all the things that are out there. So to get out there, even if you're just consuming content and not writing it, there's uh, there's actually new people there that are worth following and seeing what they're up to and um, seeing what, what ideas they want to share with the community. Yep. Yep. And blog. I mean, I know blogging is in some, some ways it's people think it's passe, but it's the best way to share your ideas, to be honest. Like someone, I saw a post on Mastodon where someone was asking like, how do people learn? And they went through all these, all these uh, uh, ways that people could vote on. But there was nothing about reading a book, reading a blog, like reading someone's ideas and absorbing them and then and then using them and and figuring out some some enhancements. So my I mean I'm old school. I still like buying books. Um actually I'm kind of writing a book. We'll talk about that maybe in the future, but um but reading and sharing your ideas in something longer than a uh social media uh like 400 characters or or less is the best way to to do it and then post that out on social media platforms and get people 
talking about it and take that feedback. Don't, don't take criticism the wrong way. Be open to criticism. Uh, be like Ted Lasso. I, I mean, Ted Lasso appreciates the like getting criticized. So I'll, I'll give a plug to like a great TV show that I've been watching for the last couple of years. But, uh, you know, we're kind of gone beyond our, our planned 30 minutes, which is, which is awesome. I don't mind going past 30 minutes. I don't want to go too, too long, but uh, I do appreciate everyone kind of uh, coming back. If you're new to us, we're out on uh, breakpoint.show is our, is our website. And you can find a lot of information out there. Uh, reach out to us. You can find our, our social media links on that, on that site. We'll have all the uh, show notes for this episode on YouTube and on our uh, RSS feed. We should be out on all the major podcast platforms. So Apple, Google, Stitcher, Spotify, uh, Pocket Casts. I, I, I made a big effort last weekend of just pushing us out on all the major, major platforms. So and then we're out on social media also as a show. So you can find us in on different social media platforms. But reach out to us. We love feedback. If you don't like what we're talking about or don't agree what we're talking about, awesome. Tell us that. Tell us what you want to hear from us. Uh, give us some nicknames for uh, lead because... Uh, he needs he needs a nickname. So uh, so dog dad is isn't the best nickname. So uh, <laughs> but I, I do want to appreciate and say I appreciate everyone. I appreciate you two doing this uh, because it's a lot of fun. It, I forgot how how fun podcasting is. And uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Chris, for all the effort you put in yep. so far. Thank you, man. Yeah, I'm looking forward to kind of uh, future episodes and stuff like that. So, yeah, uh, it's yeah. always fun to rib Martin. So it's it's one it of my is. it's one of my it hobbies. Is. So the Belgian Thunder Machine. I, I I think that's his new nickname because I always <laughs> call Martin the Machine because <laughs> I I can't keep up with with how fast he comes out with new ideas and content and code so but he's the belgian thunder machine so uh that's that's a new thing i'm, I'm totally expecting a khalid photoshop now yeah, <laughs> yes but uh thank you everyone and come back in two weeks we'll have a new episode uh this was and i forgot to put to say in the beginning what the date was this was recorded on, was it August 8th, 2023? August so, 8th. We are in a time loop maybe, but it's August 8th. Yeah, August 8th. So, uh, yeah, thank you, and we'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye.